If you're on FNAF Reddit or Twitter, surely you can't get away from people talking about the Mimic. And honestly, it's for good reason. The Tales from the Pizzaplex books have been bringing heat for months and slowly revealing lore about security breach as they went. And then the Bobby Dots conclusion came out and said, hey stupid, Gregory is patient 46 and was probably like an Afton slave. But before we can even process that, Nexi is coming out May 2nd and it promises even more lore. Lucky for me and you, however, Barnes and Noble doesn't care about release dates. And this book, this book has turned Security Breach, Help Wanted, and the majority of the FNAF timeline on its head. One book, one story in one book, really, all with a new antagonist, the Mimic. Look, slices, put on your aprons. We've got a big theory to bake today. Also, let me know if you like the new lighting. I'm trying to make the lighting look better. I'm still getting used to all the professional YouTuber stuff. If anyone knows how to fix this, so it's just a fusion of color and not these weird bars of light, let me know. First, let's gather some ingredients. I hear you. What the hell is the Mimic? For those not in the loop, the epilogues of the Tales book have been telling a sequential story, kind of like how the Fazbear Frights had the Stitch Line Stingers, but this time about a new character, the Mimic. But before we get into what the boy is up to now, let's see where he came from. In Nexi, the book coming out next week, so spoiler warning, one of the stories is called The Mimic, detailing its creation. Edwin, the character from the Storyteller, at this time in his early 30s, so we're talking about 1980s-ish, had been contracted by Fazbear Entertainment to make several animatronics after his vacuum took off in sales. It's theorized that this is Mr. Hugs, but we're not sure. They bought him an old rundown factory to work and live in, and he and his wife Fiona tried to make a life there. They were planning on having a son David, but unfortunately, Fiona died during childbirth. But David survived, and Edwin was left to care for his son alone. He wasn't the best father, needing time to do his work and not really taking care of David as frequently as needed be, which is when he gets the perfect idea. If he could create a robot that could learn and befriend David and play with him, Edwin would have way more time to do the jobs he needs to to make more money to give them a better life. It was a win-win. So he gets to work, and using some spare parts, he cobbles together the upper body of an animatronic endoskeleton, head, torso, and arms. It looks somewhat frightening, frankly, being described as having large white eyes, a full white-toothed mouth, having large pincers for hands, an articulated neck to a metallic spine jutting out into a sharp rib cage. It was also covered with wires and a rather large processor on the back of its neck. But the real key here was the programming. To make it work best, he created a complex AI that learns and mimics what it sees. He names the creation after what it was created to do, Mimic, and after the name of the program inside of it, Mimic 1. David takes to it immediately, and the two begin playing every day. The Mimic copies everything David does, right down to the minutia details. David constantly holds a tiger plushie in his arm, and the Mimic begins always having one arm curled towards it, pantomiming holding a tiger. It even colors and draws poorly with crayon like David. Everything was great, until it wasn't. One day before Edwin was fully awake to supervise, David's ball went out the front door, and going after it to catch it, he runs in the street, is hit by a car, and dies. For two weeks, Edwin was in a state of shock and grief, not processing anything going on around him. He eventually does try to get back to work, but when he does, the mimic approaches him, holding David's tiger just like David used to. I get this is a traumatic event, but like, Edwin when the robot he specifically designed to mimic things mimics things? Regardless, the sight was too much to see, and in a fit of grief and rage, he just starts beating the hell out of the mimic, nearly destroying it completely. Crying and frothing at the mouth, he knew that his anger wasn't towards this mimic, but towards himself. This was just an outlet, an excuse. When he was done, the Mimic was a shell of what it formerly was, badly damaged but still operational. Edwin disappeared, not to be heard from for some time, but the Mimic stayed, and the Mimic had just learned violence. Fazbear sent in a group of technicians to scope out the factory. After all, Edwin had gone AWOL in the middle of a few projects for Fazbear. They were hoping to salvage something on their visit. Eventually, they found the Mimic on the ground, unable to get up. Realizing that there's some advanced tech here, they took some legs from an inoperable endoskeleton and stuck it on it to see what would happen. But when the Mimic was fully repaired, it went on the assault. The Mimic was just doing what it learned, putting things away in the fridge and hanging things up in the closet. Except this time it's been tainted with violence, and the things he's putting away are people. 
brutally killing them. One particularly dangerous thing about this exoskeleton is it seems to be able to wear any exoskeleton. Any animatronic costume it can find, it puts on and wears with ease. So any suit lying around could be a mimic if left unattended. Which, to the dismay of the second group sent by Fazbear, it uses to wait and stalk its prey before striking, attacking each member of the party of three that visit in a different animatronic suit. The story titled The Mimic ends there, but the story about the mimic keeps going. In the epilogues, we learn quite about the mimics actually, as one of the children we'll talk about found an old Fazbear employee handbook that mentions the mimics. In fact, there was a whole line of endoskeletons called Mimic. They were made to expand and contract to fit any kind of animatronic costume, and learned via mimicking, so instead of wasting time coding, you could teach it like any kind of choreographer would teach a dancer. However, they were discontinued due to some terrible event, so there shouldn't be any left. You know, this ruler is becoming surprisingly useful. After all, I was able to use it to get through that one locked door, but it's kind of bent on one end now. Almost looks like an antenna. Oh, a sponsor. <clears throat> Today's video is sponsored by Morgan & Morgan. Injured and don't know where to start? With Morgan & Morgan, it's so easy. Because submitting a claim doesn't have to be this long, stuffy process. You don't have to visit law offices or schedule consultations. With Morgan & Morgan, you can submit a claim without ever leaving your couch. And that claim you could be submitting is worthwhile. I mean, what is your health worth? When you're injured, you have to keep in mind that those injuries could affect your future. And if they do, don't you want good representation? Good representation that uses every tool in its tool belt to help you. Because Morgan & Morgan is a 21st century company. They've modernized the whole injury law process. You can submit case documents and photos, even contact your legal team, all from your phone. In eight clicks or less, you can submit a claim with Morgan & Morgan. Think about the shock that happens after a car accident. Obviously, you need to collect yourself and make sure that you and the other person are okay, that the authorities get called, that your insurance gets called. But after that, before the dust settles, you need to get legal representation. And that legal representation could would be Morgan & Morgan. If you're ever injured in an accident, you can check out Morgan & Morgan. You can submit a claim in eight clicks or less without leaving your couch. For more information, go to forthepeople.com slash rytoast or dial pound law, that's pound 529 from your cell phone. Thanks again to Morgan & Morgan for sponsoring today's video. Morgan & Morgan, for the people. Jeez, what is? Oh, it's like a wire. Oh boy. Something that could function as an antenna and a wire. We're making a doohickey again. Cut to the creation of the Mega Pizzaplex. A group of construction workers are surprised that a shipment of animatronics arrived this early into the erection of the Pizzaplex. <laughs> They're even more surprised when one of the animatronics sticks out amongst the others. A bare endoskeleton with a bulging collection of metal rods and plates almost hobbled together with white eyes and orange pupils, and all but the head being dark and discolored, almost as if it were burnt, along with one and a half rabbit ears ears sticking straight up almost like antenna. But one of the workers has an idea. Their current task is disassembling the endoskeletons lying around the facility so they can begin working. Gil notices that this new endoskeleton they found is pretty highly programmed. So he goes into the program and adds a directive to take apart the endoskeletons lying on the ground and throw their body parts into a pile. And it does this fairly quickly. And when it runs out of endoskeletons, it rips apart every construction worker present, throwing their body parts into a pile. Once again, just following orders. Sometime after this, six kids break into the Pizzaplex looking to cause shenanigans. The story of these kids is still ongoing, but we've learned a lot about the Mimic so far. First, it has some sort of EMP-like effect on nearby electronics. Depending on how close it gets to it, it'll either start short-circuiting or even shut off completely while the Mimic is around. Second, it speaks and is intelligent. It tries several times to trick the children to go to specific locations by talking across their radio signal, pretending like one of the kids is stuck somewhere. Third, as mentioned, it can expand and contract to fit into any costume. And finally, fourth, the program inside the Mimic is titled Mimic 1. You'd think the epilogues would be the end, but that program actually makes an appearance in the Storyteller, a story from the fifth Tales of the Pizzaplex installment in which we once again meet Edwin, this time much older and later in the company's life. I've been all over the Storyteller a few times, so very briefly... <gasps> 
The chairman of the board wants to replace the creative team with an AI that can take things, regurgitate them into new stories, and then program the entire Pizzaplex using that so he doesn't have to hire anybody else to make new stories. They do this by creating a giant boobab tree that has wires that connect throughout the entire Pizzaplex. On the center console, they attach the Tiger Rock animatronic head, which has the Mimic One program on it. When Edwin sees the Tiger Rock animatronic head, he has vivid flashbacks to something terrible that has happened and resolves to try to stop the storyteller before things get any worse. Eventually, the chairman locks Edwin inside while he's trying to mess with the computer, hoping that it will scare him into being fired from the company. But after a few days of nothing happening, he goes to check in on Edwin, finding that he suffocated while drawing several different crayon drawings with I'm sorry written all over it. The Bobat tree then locks the chairman inside as well, slowly suffocating him, and even though the chairman rips off the Tiger Rock animatronic head from the wiring, it still keeps on functioning, implying that it's haunted. <sighs> so that's a lot, but how does any of this relate to the games? Does any of it at all? Yes strongly. So let's start mixing our ingredients and seeing what kind of theories start to form. I'm not gonna beat around the bush or build anything up here. Straight up, I think Burn Trap is the mimic. I mean, it's a violent, burnt looking endoskeleton that lives under the pizza plex and has rabbit ears. It's pretty hard to interpret that any other way. But what other evidence do we have to link the mimic to Burn Trap? A fair bit, actually. And just to be clear in my language here, moving forward, if I'm talking about specifically the endoskeleton from the book, I'll say the mimic, but if I'm talking about the endoskeleton from the games, I'll say burn trap, even if I think that is the same character. Just to keep things more clear. First, as many people pointed out way before I would have ever noticed, when we first see burn trap in the opening cutscene and later when we see him walking in the ending cutscene, he has one arm tucked up to his chest, almost as if he's holding a plush just like the Mimic would do with David's Tiger. Second, the description we get of the Mimic in the epilogues is pretty close to Burn Trap in general, plus some extras. The base endoskeleton is pretty close. The ears, the burnt appearance, the rib cage, the giant row of teeth. The differences here are really twofold. One, the Mimic is never described as having any organic parts attached to it, whereas Burn Trap clearly does to some extent. And two, the Mimic's eyes are white but Burn Trap's eyes are black. But I will say, I think I have an explanation for that one, which we'll get into later. What I really wanna get into right now are the implications of this. If Burn Trap really is the mimic, that explains a lot of weird things that went unexplained in Security Breach. First off, the endoskeleton maze in the basement. It's so weird that there are just these wall paintings of what robots should and shouldn't do, with graffiti by Vanny editing it to make it a parody of what it's trying to say. But if you were trying to train a mimic endoskeleton, this is exactly where you would do that, with pictures before they get to the real thing, just to make sure that they're safe before children could get in harm's way. They would see these images, and mimic them. This also lends an explanation to one of the weirder interactions between Burntrap and Freddy. In the secret boss battle against him, Burntrap seems to approach a monitor showing Freddy and tries to remotely take over his system or something. It's never clearly explained what's happening, we just know that if we let it happen, eventually Freddy attacks us. It seems like he's trying to remotely take control of Freddy. But what if that's not the case? We know that the glitch trap virus is likely infecting all of the animatronics, but one of the only reasons Freddy doesn't attack us is because he's in safe mode, which he entered when rebooted. So what are the times Freddy does attack you? When you mess up Simon Says in Parts and Service, and when he runs out of power while you're riding him. Parts and service could be explained by just hitting the wrong button and triggering an attack. The running out of power thing is what I want to focus on. It's not like when Freddy runs out of power, you're just trapped inside and die there. If you're inside Freddy when he runs out of power, he will pick you up and kill you, purposefully. It almost seems like his safe mode fails. Like if Freddy doesn't have enough power, he can't remain in safe mode. And once safe mode is turned off, Glitchtrap can take hold again and make Freddy aggressive. All that is to say, Freddy's power being lowered or turned off takes off safe mode. So what if in that boss fight, Burntrap isn't trying to remotely hack him at all? He's simply trying to harness the EMP effect that the Mimic has to try to lower or even shut off Freddy's systems to take him out of safe mode and attack Gregory. It at least somewhat explains a rather odd attack that up until now had no explanation. Another thing that always stuck out to me as odd is these endoskeletons in the parts and service area. We have one twitchy one up front and then five in the back lit up differently. That meant something, it had to, but I didn't have a clue. At first I sort of thought it was an allegory for the missing child incident, but it wasn't really clear. Until last week, 
when we started replaying Security Breach with the Mimic in mind to look for any clues that Security Breach might have left us. When we were looking there, MacDave in the chat suggested that it might be a code, but before we could even think about it, Mr. Otto tried interpreting it as Morse code, leaving white and red to be dash or dot, and the unlit Mimic as a space. Well, if it's dash, dot, dash, dash, it spells out no, nothing really there. But if we swap it and it's dot, dash, dot, dot, it spells out AI right in front of a twitching endoskeleton. Artificial intelligence is what powers the mimic. Safe to say I had an appropriate reaction. No f***ing shot. White, red, blank, white, white. If white is short dash and red is, if white is dot and red is dash, dot dash is A, blank, dot dot is I. It's f***ing AI, which is what the mimic is. No shot. God fucking damn it. By the way, we're not done with Security Breach. Tonight at 9.30 p.m. EST, we'll be live watching other people's theories and takes on the Mimic and then finishing up Security Breach tonight. So if you want to be there and hang out for the live stream, I recommend subscribing as YouTube might actually notify you if you do. Also, it really helps and, you know, it, it makes me feel good because the number go up. Okay, that's all Burn Trap and the Mimic, but the burning question in everyone's mind is, where did it come from? How did it get here? Has he been here the whole time? Did he witness any of the murder? The book does seem to imply this, but I don't think that's the case. In the latest epilogue, the teens are trying to justify its behavior, and one of them states, I wish I could read all of this, but it seems like the original Mimic began mimicking not just other animatronics, but also people. And it did it in ways that weren't intended. I'm not sure what it did, I can just make out the words, misconstrue, scared, potential disaster, and deactivate remaining Mimic Endos. So the theory goes that the Mimic saw one of the missing child incidences and that's where it learned all this violence from. While that's a perfectly reasonable explanation, I don't buy it really. The Mimic is a very active animatronic. Are we really supposed to believe that it just sat lifeless while still being powered on so it could learn for 50 plus years just watching bad things happen and not doing anything, but then all of a sudden start wreaking havoc? No, and I think I have a more plausible idea all of it comes down to the books being a parallel to the canon, not one-to-one. -one. I'm hesitant to assume that Edwin Murray himself is canon to the FNAF franchise, at least to the game's timeline. But think about this character for a second. Someone from the very beginning with an amazing talent at making animatronics who has their only child die. That sounds almost exactly like Henry Emily, a character we do have evidence for in the games and more information about from the Silver Eyes. If you replace the car accident that killed David to William killing Charlotte, the story is nearly identical. It could literally happen as is. So let's pop this mixture into the oven and see what kind of horrors rise. Being so lost in his work, Henry creates the Mimic to help take care of Charlotte. It begins to copy her movements, her mannerisms. But then, one fateful day, William kills Charlotte. After he sees the Mimic still copying what Charlotte used to do, Henry loses it in a fit of rage and grief and tries to destroy the endoskeleton he created. He pulverizes the machine and leaves everything behind. But he didn't destroy the Mimic, he simply damaged it. There it sat, stewing in the knowledge that it had, still in Henry's workshop, remembering the violence that had been done on it, but the memories of Charlotte. Who knows how long it sat for, relearning those data sets, until finally, one day, Fazbear sweeps every location they still have access to to look for any sort of animatronic to scan into their upcoming VR game. Chock full of recreations of the actions and consequences of Fazbear Entertainment and the owners therein. Fazbear finds the Mimic Endoskeleton, and while most of it is severely damaged, the programming is still solid. In fact, a program that can copy what it sees and recreate new things would be perfect to speed along programming this VR game. It's scanned into the game, and suddenly, Glitch Trap is born. Not of William's agony or remnant, but rather a program literally created to see and rehash what it sees. Suddenly flooded with never-ending imagery of animatronics and violence. Mentions of missing children incidents, Spring Trap. The virus begins to manifest, showing the tears and drool of its creator when its creator beat it. It wants out, to go and do what it was programmed to do. This is just a simulation. It wants real people. And when Jeremy begins testing, it tries to leave. 
It knows how to enter an animatronic suit. It tries the same thing with Jeremy, but Jeremy took a drastic measure and cut himself out of the game to prevent that from happening. But the mimic is smart and learns from that. The direct approach won't work here. It needs to be subtle. When the next tester comes into the game, the mimic knows to wait. That tester, however, begins recording voice lines inside of the game, starting with, Hello? Can you hear me? The mimic learns. Eventually, through trial and error, it enthralls Vanessa and earns itself an ally in the real world. Together, they manage to get the Pizzaplex set up just the way it wants it, and Vanessa sends over the battered and bruised mimic endoskeleton to the place. When the FNAF 6 location is discovered underground, the corpse of William Afton is found. This, I think, is where the mimic truly becomes burn trap. The mimic was built to fit into any animatronic, so it grafts itself to the corpse of William Afton getting a newer body but retaining its core features. But once it does this, the agony left behind in Afton's corpse corrupts the mimic, turning its eyes from white to all black, its pupils from orange to purple. The mimic begins to relearn who it was, what it was meant to do. The silo is evidence of that. The physical mimic is trying to fast track the progression that the digital one got inside of the VR game but something wasn't right. Sure, it was recreating the Afton family, but something else was deep inside the physical mimic. Some memory of its initial programming deep, deep down. That hint of Charlotte Emily. After all, it still held its arm in the same position that Charlotte did when holding onto her toys. That's why the nightmare plushes are all over the Pizzaplex, honestly really close to FNAF's first security breach interpretation. It's just not quite the same. While Charlie's influence is here, it's only via code. The mimic is just an AI. This interpretation actually clears up one more big mystery in security breach, in my opinion. The sister location room code. I think it's meant to be from the perspective of Henry. Now, I don't know if he would have actually written this, and if he did, I have no idea how, but it mirrors his wishes for exactly what's happening now. Break and mend, I built the breath. He built the mimic, something that even though he broke it, was mended. They hunt now, drawn to life. There's no longer one mimic, but two. A digital one in the form of glitch trap, and a physical one in the form of burn trap. They hunt now. Not real, still keen. The mimics aren't real people, but they sure as hell are smart as one. And frit and fraught with thought and zest and jest, no blunt woes. This is the corruption the mimic has undergone. They were built simply to mimic basic actions, but instead, the emotions and woes they've experienced have turned them violent. Dodge, duck, flash, shoot, crawl, run, crush the vile band. He's begging someone to stop this. The virtual mimic corrupted all of the Pizzaplex animatronics. You can't just take down the mimic anymore. You need to take down the mimic and all of its thralls. Cry not, try not, do not hold out hope. No, your life, your aim will save those with soul. Some final words of encouragement. You may not succeed, but you have to try to help those who are still alive. William is long dead and being tormented by Cassidy in purgatory, but the Mimics have learned everything he's done and more, and they have a prime directive to make it happen again. And that's everything we know about the Mimic and how it affects Security Breach. I think it's a way more compelling villain than just William again, and it allows us to move on from William in a major way. But like, the real question is, does this completely fix the lore or break it into a thousand pieces? Hopefully it doesn't break it, because I really think the movie has a good chance to fix a lot of the issues the lore has. If you want to know why, go ahead and watch the video right there. In the meantime, a huge shout out to the best patrons, the Toasted Slices, Emberisk, Charlie Bean, Lovey Puppy, Stormachow, Just BKZ, Chick B, Lola Fembo, The Viper 26, Lee Han, James Reiner, Emily De La Sierra, Snow Blossom, Comrade Nika, Raven Eris, Glamrock Bonnie Isn't a Ghani, Bucky Ray, Mystic Angel, Super Moosh, Untrusted Life, Queen Coda, Dionysus, MD Switchy, Flip, Loose, Hyperdroid, Mini Metals, Emmy Layton, and Sharp Wire. And until next time, as always, stay toasty slices.